This is section 2.9, the derivative as a function, objective 3, which is to understand how a function can fail to be differentiable in both a graphical and an analytical context. By the time we're done, you should be able to explain how you determine points of non-differentiability when a function is given to you analytically rather than graphically. So to start this off, we're going to talk about the words that we will encounter in these types of problems. The first is the word differentiable. So kind of like we have a function that is continuous, we can also have a function that is differentiable. So a function is differentiable if at x equals a, f prime of a, which are those definitions of derivatives that we've seen in 2.7 and in 2.8, if those derivatives exist, then we say that the function is differentiable at a. Turns out, well, if the function is differentiable at every value on the open interval from a to b, in other words, this will exist for every value of x in between a and b, then we say we're differentiable on an open interval. Now, what's nice for us is that differentiability and continuity are linked, but they're only linked in a one-way pattern. So if f is differentiable at x equals a, then f must be continuous at a, no exceptions. So if this derivative exists, then we get that statement of continuity. Now what we have to be careful about is that the converse of this theorem is not true. Just because something is continuous, we are not guaranteed differentiability. So let's look at why. If we think about what it means to be differentiable, it turns out that there are four ways where you can fail to have a tangent line. The first is if you have a discontinuity, which is what we just saw in that theorem. If we are differentiable, we have to be continuous. So if we aren't continuous, there's no way that we could be differentiable. So that's one of the ways that will screw up differentiability. Now remember, discontinuities come in four forms. We can have a joint, we can have a hole, we can have an asymptote, or we can have an oscillation. So we need to be watching for those in our piecewise functions and in our non-piecewise functions. The other ways that we can fail to have a tangent slope or a derivative is if the slope coming from one side Side is drastically different than the slope coming from the other side. We see that in these two cases. If we have a corner, or if we have a really sharp corner, which is called a cusp, then we are not going to have a derivative at those points of continuity. And the fourth and final type of way that we can fail differentiability is with a vertical tangent. Here we have positive slopes that are getting steeper and steeper and steeper and steeper, and then when we hit that point of tangency right here in the middle, we've got a vertical tangent which does not have a defined slope. So in since a derivative is just the slope of that tangent line, whenever we've got a tangent line that's vertical, we're not going to have a slope associated with it. So with our first example, we want to write statements involving the definition of the derivative and the definition of continuity that are true for each of these functions. So I've chosen functions that are easy to graph. Hopefully you recognize them from last year when you did your parent functions. So if we look at this first one here, this is a cubic that has been moved two units to the right. So if we look, or not cubic, a cube root. So here I've got a picture of that cube root of x minus 2. And we can see right here at 2 that I'm going to have a vertical tangent. It was that same picture that we had up in our little chart above. So when I have that vertical tangent, I'm not going to be differentiable even though I did not have to pick up my pencil and I was continuous. So what I'd write here for my true differentiability statement is that the limit as h approaches 0 on the function for 2 plus h minus the function with the 2 plugged in over h, so here's that definition of the derivative at 2, is not going to exist. By contrast, the continuity is going to work. So the limit as x approaches 2 on that function is going to equal the output of the function when I plug a 2 in. We would get 0 both times. So if we look at part b, this one again should be easy to graph. It's that reciprocal function, and we have an asymptote at 2. So in this case, we had to pick up our pencil. And because we pick up our pencil, we've got a discontinuity, which means the limit as I'm approaching 2 not only does not exist, but it doesn't equal the output either, because there is no output. And for the same reason, because we're not differentiable, or excuse me, continuous, we cannot be differentiable. So we can write that that derivative at 2 does not exist, using the definition of the derivative at 2.
Our third and final example, this is an absolute value. So the V that has been moved two units to the right. And we see that we have a sharp corner at two. So that means, again, we are not going to have a derivative at two. So we write that the definition of the derivative at two is not going to exist. But when we drew the graph itself, we did not have to pick our pencil up. So that meant that we are going to be continuous even if we are not differentiable. Example two is a little tough because there's three things that are in here and our job is to figure out what we can do easily and what we can do the hard way simply because they tell us that we have to. So if we read this it says prove analytically that this function is not differentiable at six. Well we know we've got a corner there so we already know we're not going to have a derivative there but we want to prove it analytically. Now in addition to that we want to find a formula for f prime of x and we want to sketch its graph. So I'm going to do the formula and the sketching of the graph first because that's a little simpler. If I graph my original function Notice that it is that parent function absolute value, so it's a v, and we've moved it to the right six units. So if we think about the relationship between the graphs of the original and the derivative, it's very easy to sketch the graph of the derivative because here to the right of six, I've got a slope of positive one. So at six, moving forward, I'm going to have a slope of positive one. On the other side, I can see that the slope is negative 1. Now what I've done here is I have not drawn a closed circle on either of these locations because I know that there is not a derivative at 6. So it's not going to be defined. I'm not going to be able to get an output that works. So I can write the formula for f prime of x looking at the graph and say that f prime of x will have an output of positive 1 as long as x is strictly greater than 6 and f prime of x will be negative 1 as long as x is less than 6. So now we're going to do the tough part which is to prove analytically that this function is not differentiable at 6. So to get there we're going to use the definition of the derivative at 6. We know from section 2.8 that that will be the limit as h approaches 0 of f of 6 plus h minus f of 6 over h. And if I plug 6 plus h into this function, I'll get the limit as h approaches 0 of an absolute value of 6 plus h minus 6 minus an absolute value of 6 minus 6. If I simplify this now, I end up with the 6 is canceling and I'll have an absolute value of h over an h. So the goal is to figure out whether this limit exists. Looking at this, I can see that it's a piecewise function in disguise and that the joint of this piecewise occurs at zero. So I can't compute this limit unless I look at it coming from the left and coming from the right. If I look at it coming from the right, that means my h is a positive number, so the absolute value is going to leave it alone and I can reduce to get a 1. If I'm approaching 0 from the left, then the inside of this absolute value is a negative number, which means the absolute value will take its opposite. And when that happens, I end up with a limit of negative 1, which we can kind of see on here. As I'm approaching 6 on the derivative graph from the right, I'm getting positive 1. And as I'm approaching an x value of 6 from the left on the derivative graph, my y values are getting closer and closer to negative 1. Because I got close to two different values, that means that the derivative at 6 does not exist. Example 3 hammers home that concept of local linearity as, as a indicator of differentiability. So we're going to go put this function into our calculators and we're going to graph it and then we're going to zoom in either toward negative 1, 0 and look at the behavior of the graph and then we're going to zoom toward the origin and look at the behavior. And as we do that we're going to be thinking about what's different and what that means about the differentiability. 
So if I look at my calculator here, I've got that function in already and I've graphed it. Looking at it right now, it's real hard to tell whether there's something funky going on at negative 1 or if there's something funky going on at 0. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to zoom in at negative 1. So when I zoom in, I have the option to choose a new center. And I don't think I can type in a negative 1. No, nope, doesn't work. So I need to just move left until I'm close to negative 1. And I'll hit Enter. Now remember that if the function is differentiable, it won't have any discontinuities, corners, cusps, or vertical tangents. So as we zoom in, it's going to look more and more like a line. And if we look, we can see that we're kind of still have a bit of a curve, but we've only zoomed in twice. If I zoom in again, we can see that the graph of that function looks an awful lot like the graph of a line. And because of that, we can say that this function has a derivative at negative 1. By contrast, when we look at zooming in near 0, we're going to see a different type of behavior. So if I zoom in this time at 0, It doesn't seem to be straightening out, but it could be that we just aren't close enough. So if I zoom in again, I see that that little corner thing is getting even sharper. And when I zoom in again, I am not getting any better. So as I zoom in closer and closer to the origin, I'm seeing that corner getting sharper and sharper. It looks like it's almost going to be a cusp. So what we can say is different about the behavior is that at the point negative 1, 0, the function is locally linear and its derivative at negative 1 exists. On the other hand, at the origin, the function is not locally linear. and f prime at 0 does not exist. With example 4, we're going to see, again, analytical approaches to determining differentiability, and we're going to see how that is supported by the picture or the graph of the function. So to get there, we're going to have some new vocabulary. And this vocabulary is called a left-hand and a right-hand derivative. The left-hand and the right-hand derivatives are defined to be these limits, where the left hand, I'm letting h approach 0 from the left, or I'm letting x approach a from the left. Same thing for the right hand, instead of coming from the left, we'll have h approaching 0 from the right, or x approaching a from the right. So graphically, what we're talking about is nailing down the point a, f of a, and then choosing a point on the left of that point, and then dragging them together, seeing what that secant slope gets close to, or nailing down the point a, f of a, and then getting closer and closer using a point from the right-hand side. So graphically, on example 4, we first need to be able to graph the function itself. So we have a piecewise function with three branches, and when x is smaller than 0, we have an output of 0 all the time. When x is between 0 and 4, we're on a line whose y-intercept is 5 and whose slope is negative 1. So if I plug in my boundary point, which is 0, I got a 5. And if I plug in my other boundary point, which is 4, I'm going to get a 1. So those will be open circles, and I'm going to connect them with a line that has a slope of negative 1. My third and final branch, which I get to be on when x is greater than or equal to 4, will give me a boundary point. When I plug in a 4, I'll get a 1 over a 1. That means it's going to connect with this branch right here. And then I have an asymptote at 5. Turns out that as I approach that 5 from the left-hand side, the bottom of this will be positive, so I'll be heading up. And as I approach that asymptote at 5 from the right-hand side, I'll be subtracting numbers that are larger than 5, which will give me a negative output. So here is our piecewise function. It's easy to answer part b because it says, where is f discontinuous? That's a synonym for saying, when do I have to pick up my pencil? As I was graphing this, I had to pick it up 
at zero to jump to this branch, and then I had to pick it up again when I had the asymptote. So f is discontinuous both at zero and at five. Now the next part, c, asks where f is not differentiable. So we know that there are four ways to screw up differentiability. We screw it up either with a discontinuity, a corner, a cusp, or a vertical tangent. Looking at this picture, we can see that we have a discontinuity here. So that's a problem. We have a possible corner, but we don't know for sure if that's going to work out to be a corner or not, so we'll withhold judgment on that one. And then we have to pick up our pencil again at 5. So there's the two discontinuities are causing problems with differentiability, and then we have the prospective corner. So we're going to examine that corner analytically looking at the left and right hand derivatives. So this f prime of 4 approaching from the left will be the limit as h approaches 0 from the left hand side of our f of 4 plus h minus f of 4 all over h. Now what makes this tricky is we have to think about which branch of the function we're going to be in as h is approaching 0 from the left. So if I look at this innards, when h is a negative number, I'm going to end up with a number inside that's a little bit smaller than 4. Because this inside is smaller than 4, that's going to put me into this branch, which deals with values or that are inside the function smaller than 4. So when I plug 4 plus h into that middle branch, I will get the limit as h approaches 0 from the left of that middle branch with a 4 plus h plugged in. When I plug 4 into the function, now I'm looking for what includes 4, and that's this branch. So if I plug the 4 into this branch, I just get a 1. Now if I simplify this, I can see that the 5 minus 4 is going to give me 1, and then I'm going to subtract the 1. So I'm left with a negative h over h, which reduces to give me a limit of negative 1. That means my left hand derivative at 4 was negative 1. Let's support that graphically. That says if I nail down my point at 4, 1, and then I choose another point to the left of it, and I scoot that point toward the 4, then all of those secant lines are going to have the same slope as this middle branch, which was negative 1. By contrast, if I go to the other side, now I'm going to look at the limit as h approaches 0 from the right. And again, I'm going to use my definition, and then I'm going to determine which branch I'm involved with. So if I have an h that is bigger than 0, but really close to 0, this inside here is going to be a number larger than 4. So I have to look for numbers that are larger than 4, and that happens here in the bottom branch. So I will plug this 4 plus h into the bottom branch. That'll give me a limit as h approaches 0 from the right of a 1 over a 5 minus a 4 plus an h. Then I'll subtract what comes out when I plug in the 4. Again, I look for the equals. There's the 4, so it's the branch that I've used before, and I get a 1. Then I'm dividing by h. Well, if I simplify that, my goal is to get that limit. You see that I've got a complex fraction, so I'm going to fix it the way I have fixed it in the past. Dividing by h is the same as multiplying by a 1 over h. And then I'm going to get a common denominator here. So on the first fraction, I have a 1 over a 5 minus a 4, which is a 1, minus an h. And now I want to subtract 1, which will be multiplied by the 1 minus h over 1 minus h. If I simplify that, I get a limit as h approaches 0 from the right of a 1 minus a 1 plus an h over that 1 minus an h times an h. Notice that the 1's cancel, which means the h's can now reduce out, and I'm left with a limit as h approaches 0 from the right of a 1 over a 1 minus h. If I plug that 0 in, I get a slope of 1. I did not get the same slope this time as I got when I was coming at it from the left. 
So graphically what this tells me is that if I nail down that point 41 and I pick a point on the right hand side and then drag it toward, I'm getting really close to a tangent slope of 1. Since the slope coming from the left was negative 1 and the slope from the right was positive 1 and they don't match, then I'm not going to get a derivative at 4. You should now be able to do your notes web exam problems numbers 4 through 8 and then explain how you find those points of non-differentiability when a function is given to you analytically instead of graphically.